For some reason, I had sections. Let me make sure I recorded this. OK, some reason I had four sections in chapter 13. It just seems like all the books, all the all the chapters have four sections, but this is only three. And it's just going to be one of those little matching ones. Twelve questions. We are going to have a unit test next week. It'll be on. Everything from everything. The Renaissance to. Let's get birds up here. It'll be from uh, going to the Renaissance, Renaissance art, a little bit of exploration and the beginnings of the Reformation. I know it sounds like a big test, but then the next one is huge because we have lots of wars to fight. And so. Uh, that'll be the plan. I I haven't decided if I'll include Henry VIII in this one. I'll probably include him in this unit, too. And I'll give you a list then probably Friday. I'll, I'll at least post it for sure by the weekend. And. The quiz, let me make sure it is assigned and ready to go. Okay, I have to click like 45 buttons. I know this is so exciting. Huh. We have a little bit of an issue. The quiz did not pop up. The heck? Ah, give me a minute. I know. Now you got to watch me work. Here, I don't want you to watch me. It says it's saving this. So let me see if it's up. OK, this should be in. If not, I'm about to redo it. For some reason, it didn't save the assignment. Aha, here it is. OK. So it should be up. Okay, so the quiz should be up then by the. End of class, so let's get back to work. All right, just a few things on exploration, a few things on the Renaissance, and that's all we're going to do today. Do today. I am going to assign. Ah, I hate when it, sorry, the wrong button. So I am going to sign a few things on, on the Reformation and I gave you the quiz, so that should be enough for today. And we'll do the Reformation. We are going to watch a video, uh, the day the universe changed about the printing press and the Reformation. So it fits in perfectly. And so we went to the Aztecs, the Incas, Pizarro, Potosi, and the huge just increase in money gold and silver and so let's get to there's the spanish fleet we talked about pirates pirates etc so let's go from there just a few things about this a few things about the reformation and then we're going to watch the day the universe changed there's a great video on henry the eighth for this history of britain series and that's why i'm trying to decide if i want to have that on the test okay i know i love it so you have to like it take it and let me get my little pointer going please let me know if there's any issues Okay, so let's talk very briefly about the Columbian Exchange. 
And the Colombian exchange would be one more of this uh, totally unforeseen but dramatic effects of exploration. Because the new world and old world, okay, except for a few times we mentioned the Chinese and the Norse and a few others, the Chinese, the Norse, et cetera, for the most part, uh, there's been very little connection. But once you have Columbus arriving and this massive global connection, and thus it would not happen until Columbus. Uh, I'm not saying Columbus discovered it because that's silly. The point is what Columbus led to the change. And you're going to have disease and plant life and animals switch or move all over, and this will radically shift society. So I just listed a few of them on here, but I'll tell you the most important ones. Maybe. Here we go. So we have everything from squash. Okay, I like avocados, but uh, and I like pineapples. I like peanuts. All of those are really important. Cocoa, uh, the one big communicable disease from the American syphilis. But the really the ones that have the greatest effect on the culture would be tomato and maize. Uh, corn just means anything, any grain from a, a plant. Um, but for some reason in the U.S. we call maize corn. So what the heck, doesn't really matter. The most important is potato. I can't emphasize how important potatoes are. Potatoes you can grow basically any place there's dirt and you can grow a potato. And potatoes are really easy to grow. If anybody's ever grown potato, you know what I'm talking about. You make little clones of previous potatoes. You let potatoes sit out for a while and they will begin to sprout, call them eyes will pop up and you just chop off that little part with the eye. So you make it, make sure you get the whole root, drop it in the ground, boom, a clone of that potato appears. There's also potato seeds. Um, they can grow, they're a little bit, they're hardier, but the clones are so easy. And therefore potatoes grow anywhere. And this would dramatically, okay, I put this out for Africa, but I should have put that, it got to China and would radically change China. But the threat of famine would be greatly reduced once they had the potato. To the lesser degree maize, corn grows, as long as you have relatively hot weather and water. Uh, tomatoes, just because it tastes good. But potatoes would forever change things because it greatly reduced the threat of famine. Now, some of you might be saying, wait a second, what about the potato famine in Ireland? Well, when the English conquered it, put all the good arable land for grain that they sent to England, all the Irish had to live on was potatoes. And you can survive on potatoes. And if there's enough protein, enough minerals, you might not be happy, but you can live on that. Uh, they get the point. But with the potato famine or when the potato crashes a crop, that um, devastated Ireland. Actually, the, <laughs> the potato famine spread all over Africa and Asia, but Ireland was hit the worst because the vast majority of the population needed the potato to survive. Um, we talked about this, various trinkets, liquor, and guns to Africa. And I think you can see the, the guns are the biggie. The guns would be traded for people and gold. And then of course, all of the things from the New World uh, are from Africa. And this arrow is basically all the things from the Old World to the New World. So don't think about just Africa. Okay, it didn't work out as well as I wanted. Just go with it. Uh, so all of the things, yes, olives, all of these things and olives, and onions, uh, you know, grapes, citrus fruits, all of those. But you know, coffee bean would be a radical shift when it would get here, and sugar cane, the sugar plantations, the coffee plantations, of course, the horse. And I didn't, because I have so many different diseases down here, but we've talked about this before, just generically put down disease. So we have everything, oh, the honeybee. Well, there are bees that here, but the honeybee, there are some issues with that. But, but think about, you know, flu, diphtheria, typhus, whooping cough, measles, malaria, and smallpox. All of these European diseases would totally destroy the population of the New World. There's a reason Europeans totally conquered the New World, and did, they did the same thing in Australia. The people there were, were so susceptible to disease that they're wiped out and allowed the Europeans to take over. Europeans would colonize much of Africa and big hunts of Asia, but they could not totally dominate because the population there eventually, through great hardship that they saw through the day, but they would drive them out. That's the Colombian exchange. And uh, it's, it, there's more, obviously. 
uh, this huge shift in the world and how humans interacted and the products they had. Don't forget the potato. And so you have this worldwide trade network that these goods are going to be spread all over. Don't forget what I told you, all that silver and gold that was taken uh, from the new world on these trade galleries. A lot of times they would go on the big trade. They would they weren't supposed to. The Spanish were mad, but they sent directly to what's going to be called the Philippines and China. And they just suck the gold out. There's going to be the next 250 years where Europeans are going to try to figure out a way to suck that gold and silver back out of China and get it back to Europe. And some of you might know what happens. It's called opium. And so with that, this is the basic cycle I stole from somebody else, but it kind of worked. We have the exploration. And then the conquistadors is the generic one for Spain, but basically the soldiers come in and conquer. And it's almost always followed by missionaries. You saw the same thing in the American West for the conquest of the United States. Soldiers, missionaries, settlers come in, and then it becomes an official colony in the Western US, a state. Very generic, but this process would be followed time after time after time. And let's be very clear about it. The people who lived there would be conquered. Now, in places like Africa, they were still there, and they could eventually drive out the Europeans. In the Americas, no. And so, New Spain would become the first of the, these mighty colonies. There'd be other colonies that would develop too, but Spain had the big advantage. And yes, therefore, they became a big target. Here's Portugal, you see a few other ones, like the Dutch would take up area, France. Uh, the Swedes tried a few places and then went back home, but England, New Spain. And New Spain is what we call a royal colony. It is controlled by the crown and it is, they pick a governor, they call the viceroy, it is completely controlled. And a couple things they did, they set up there. The first one was the encomienda system. And the encomienda system was the plantation system. The plantation system I mean, I can't see my mouse. Some reason I'm Okay, back to the, sorry about that. And the Indians who lived on there, they would be slaves for whoever owned it. And so they would divvy up the land in these plantations. They'd be given the conquistadors and then other noblemen, almost always born in Spain, in Europe, they would dominate the economy. And then the American Indians, okay, they, slaves is a little bit harsh of a term, <laughs> really. It was more like serfs, but they never could get off the land. But the issue is they're dying. And so in a lot of these areas, there's going to be a labor shortage. By the way, here is a conquest of the Aztecs. From a uh, from a Spanish journal, and it shows the torturing and death of the Aztecs that they resisted. And this, as I understand it, is disease as they're being tortured to death. And they originally governed this. They called this the Council of the Indies. And the reason I'm bringing this up here is to show that they still thought of this as it must be the um, it must be Asia, and that's a legacy of them. But the leader of it, the royal governor, would be called a viceroy. And the viceroy and then would have other magistrates that would lead uh, other colonies. And then the two big colonies, New Spain and Peru. Peru, New Spain. Council of the, here's the Indies, and New Spain would eventually roll all the way up here. And we'll generically call even Peru and the West Indies New Spain. And here's the class system. And so the class system, and I'll leave this up, this is a, not a bad thing to know a few of the issues about. Those on top would be called the Peninsulares. Why were they called the Peninsulares? I guess the Peninsulares. The reason why is because they're from the Iberian Peninsula, they're from Spain. These are people of European descent that are on top. 
And by the way, you know, they always show the class system as a triangle and show there's not as many peninsula layers and then this goes out to more. But let's be very clear about this. Um, there were very few of these. Creoles, these people were, um, they're European, they're of European descent, but they were born in the New World. And they were generally considered to be second class citizens. It'd be the Creoles who would uh, um, lead the revolution in New Spain in the 1820s. And then we have the Mestizos and the Mulattoes. Mestizos were people of European and American descent, and Mulattoes, people of European and African descent. And in the weird class system of Spain that would originally develop, you get you have these people, not quite Creoles, but above people who were American Indians, which remember were kind of like slaves, and then African slaves. It wasn't quite race based. It wasn't quite the system that would develop in the United States and also in Spain and Brazil uh, 200 years later. This is not yet permanent slavery. It's more complex than that. So we have European descent, born in Europe, European descent, born in the Americas. European and American Indian descent, European and African descent, and then American Indians and African slaves. A lot of American Indians were slaves. And one thing very important to understand, I put this up there so I did not forget, the influence of the Catholic Church in New Spain would be immense. Missions, churches, I mean, you go to any town across Latin America, and the most prominent building, like in Guadalajara, they have a beautiful church there. But the whole point is that very much a missionary activity. And we're going to jump right to here. So thus we have this globalization. And globalization is going to be competition. And these will not be the only empires. You're going to have the Dutch East India Company moving in the wake of the Portuguese, become more dominant than the Portuguese by the 17th century, and eventually control the Indies, AKA Indonesia. It'd be the Dutch East Indies, a Dutch colonies until 1947. It would be the oil rich Dutch East Indies. It would be that region and dominance over that would be the cause of World War II in the Pacific. Japan attacked Pearl Harbor so they could get the Dutch colony of Indonesia, oil. France would eventually, um, begin to settle New France right here along Quebec and would claim the Mississippi River and have a fight with England and then eventually would become Great Britain. And eventually Britain would be here. This is globalization, the global trade. And last big thing for this, slavery. That's a Brazilian sugar mill, and I just put it up there to remind us that you have sugar mill, which came from Africa. Sugar in the West Indies. Coffee from Africa would be in Latin America. And you also see like a large number of slaves brought into what's called British or Honduras, now it's Belize for uh, lumber. But what happened was they started creating these encomienda in New Spain, other plantations. We saw the same thing in, the, in the, the United, what's going to become the United States. And these people own the land, but they needed labor. And we're talking, don't think in terms of, oh, they have to go hire workers. These are, it's backbreaking, miserable work. Europeans, when they did come over there, would die in droves. And so they had to force people to do it. Thus, slavery. They tried to enslave American Indians. The Spanish did. In fact, that's what Ponce de Leon, when he was supposed, supposedly looking for the fountain of youth, he was actually on a slave trading expedition too. But American Indians died of disease. And so that's when you get Portuguese jumping into the African slave trade. The Portuguese slavers started trading in the first sugar plantations in what is now Haiti. And it was nothing to do with race. In fact, the term race would not have mattered. Yes, people knew you know, there are people of different colored skins and there might be some prejudice, bigotry, or fear against people with different colored skins, but racism as we know it did not exist. I will talk more about racism, but I think you can see it in this picture right here. Remember how easy it was for Amerigos Vespucci trying to loop around Africa like uh, Digama, ran into Brazil, 
what made perfect sense, in fact, it was a really good deal for the Portuguese. There wasn't as much of a shortage of labor here, and the and the Ottoman Turks kind of dominated the slave trade in the in the Mediterranean. So, right there, right there, and then Dutch and English traders jumped into it. It was there was this horrible logic to how slavery from Africa developed, and this would develop into the transatlantic slave trade. So don't forget this concept of they got land, don't have labor. They jumped into the existing slave trade and sugar plantations would be the ones that would suck human beings up. And the, the mortality rate amongst African slaves was so shockingly high, it's hard to even wrap your mind around. It'd be somewhere between 12 million and 20 million human beings would be forced over. About a third would die in the transport over. We'll talk more about the African slave trade a little bit later on. But this would develop this a totally different dynamic than any place else in the world, in the New World. You have the destruction of the American Indians, Europeans coming in desperate for labor to make money to gouge profit out of the New World. They brought in slavery, and from slavery would come racism. Here is a picture of the slave ship. The Middle Passage was the ship, for the trip from Africa to the New World. We'll talk about this a little bit more later on. And here is what they called the coffin position of people packed in tightly. The more humans you can pack into a slave boat, the more money they can make. And we're going to jump right to here. So slavery was not permanent at first. Slavery was not race-based at first. It's actually really complex. It basically... Um, it, sometimes they'd be given freedom, sometimes they'd be given partial freedom, sometimes their kids would be free, sometimes they wouldn't. There was no set rules. This is a picture of slavery in um, um, Latin America. And most died. So there wasn't this issue of having a lot of former slaves around. What did they do? They just brought in more slaves. i got to be very clear. When they talk about slavery, this it's hard to find something more brutal and horrific than this. They just chewed human beings up and they disappeared for other people's wealth. But those who did survive, those who are in slavery, the constant threat of slavery bound. There's actually a slave kingdom that were created near pres in present day Honduras and Nicaragua. A whole massive hunk of Brazil would become a slave kingdom. A lot of uh, former slaves would rebel and then become pirates. Uh, in the Caribbean. Oh, God, I can't believe I said that. And uh, this constant threat of slave rebellion. And so as a way to control the slaves and control the population, that is where racism comes from. Racism, this idea that there are different colors that should have a different color of skin should make some people on top and some people on, on the bottom. We'll talk more about this a little bit down the road. But this racism of this whole system then to control rebellions, to justify, do, 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 justify slavery and justify imperialism. This whole system that we set up, and since it's almost always white people of European descent, more and more white skinned over darker skin. And remember, American Indians have darker skin. Africans have darker skin. Asians have darker skin. Just justifying future imperialism. Um, Racism will be this entire system set up of white supremacy. People don't like to talk about white supremacy, but white supremacy is the definition of racism. And please don't uh, don't think, oh, okay, racism is just simply bigotry. It's not. And I'll talk more about this. But it's that whole system that is set up to put one race in front of another, like legal, moral, and ethical system. And so all of this will come out of European exploration, will come back to racism, will come back to these colonies being created, because what a turbulent time. Because while this is going on, oops, give me a sec. And this is the last little bit for today. New heading, big letters, even though my print is not as big, the Reformation. 
And this is the Reformation is referring to the split and then the huge fight within the Catholic Church, the Reformation. And that is a picture of Martin Luther tacking his thesis, 95 pieces on the church door at Ver the cathedral door in Württemberg. And it's a little more complex than that, but we'll get to that. So the Reformation. So this massive change in the Catholic Church. And what were the reasons for the Reformation? Well, there's a lot. First off, ah, they all came in at once. Why do you hate me? Start again. Church corruption. There's all these levels of church corruption. They've gone on for years of the church gouging money, of, of uh, every, every, um, everybody from priests to, to the pope um, doing practices that were outright greedy, having wives and mistresses and multiple children. I mean, go on and on about all these different forms of church corruption. Some were huge measures of corruption. Some were relatively minor, but the effect is cumulative. It's cumulative. And once you start thinking the church is corrupt, then you see every action that the church does is potentially corrupt. Next, next remember that Avignon papacy where the, the French forced the Pope to Avignon. They called it also the Babylonian captivity. And then there were two, and the, two popes and then three popes and this massive split. And it was clear that the Pope was becoming more and more a political tool and therefore it seemed to show more church corruption. And then there is all this um, attacks various attacks on the um, papal authority. For some reason, I put down attacked papal authority, but people started attacking it. <laughs> Tax papal authority. And so basically, there's more and more talk about uh, the church should not have full authority. And you see that with various kings starting to want to appoint uh, ministers to appoint. Just a sec. Okay, to appoint uh, bishops. You, know, they wanted that power. The pope would resist. Eventually, the secular leaders are going to win over, and the influence of the clergy began to drop. So much of the Catholic Church just simply came to be hours of dogma, repeating terms in Latin that nobody knew. To I'll tell you a couple of those stories when we get everyone together, but also we'll show it uh, in the video, so I'm saving it. Uh, to go through these procedures that seem to have no real effect on the life, the clergy would, uh, by rote memorization, speak in Latin at the services and have no idea what they're saying. And more and more, it became those who wanted to be religious, it became a personal devotion. And this is important because personal do devotion means that you're doing it on your own and therefore you're going away from the authority on top. And so much of the authority in Europe, and that includes kings, they claim they got it from God. You can see how this is disruptive. You can see how this relates to the Renaissance. A third of Europe was European, a third of Europe was church land, and some of the best land in Europe. And so not only you're gonna have uh, poor farmers who are serfs to the church and being got their labor gouged by the Catholic Church who then promises salvation. You can imagine a lot of secular kings and leaders going, I want a piece of that land, at least tax it. I'm talking Henry VIII. And then because of constant wars and various uh, mismanagement, the Avalon um, captivity, and the desire to build massive, uh, massive churches like St. Paul's or St. Peter's in Rome, the Pope needed money. We'll talk about this, but basically a way to buy yourself out of limbo, indulgences. And then lastly, the printing press. Information can spread like wildfire. And so the last couple of things, and that's the, the reason of the Reformation. Now think about what's going on. Can't you see all of these tied to the Reformation? And there's exploration and more trade and more money coming in. This is such a dramatic period, all tied together. And so, there's already been a couple calls for reforms we mentioned before. Remember John Wycliffe in England and Scotland? He called for war. There would be a fight. Uh, the Lollards would be his um, followers. There'd be um, um, in the 14th century. John Huss in Bohemia. If the Hussites would rebel against the empire. He would be burned at the stake. That's a picture there. By the way, Wycliffe would die, but they would dig him out and burn his body at the stake. 
But there's already criticism of the Pope's authority over people, the wealth of the church, the inequalities this has created. There's a call. But then remember we talked about humanism and this idea that human beings, whether there should be more literature, more art, more science, and wealth, should go to individual human beings, the individual. And we talked about Christian humanism, looking inside the church. And two classic examples are that are going to be very much connected to the Reformation and were friends. Uh, Thomas More, who would become the um, Lord Chancellor of Henry VIII and complex story. We'll talk more about Thomas More later. That's a great painting. He would write a story called Utopia. And in Utopia, uh, kind of rob this term from from Greeks. In fact, our meaning of utopia is really going to come from Thomas More. And it, it's a real big criticism of Christian Europe, a.k.a. the church. It's an imaginary island where it said the accumulation of property, a.k.a. getting rich at any cost, was a root of evil. And now think about this is just at a time when everybody is, uh, or the ideology about getting rich is changing. And therefore, for society, for the public good, we have to sacrifice some of what we have, our rights for the public good. If we give up a little bit of our rights, a little bit of our ability to just do anything we want for our own personal well-being, we could have a full and complete society. This was a major indictment of Catholic Europe. Thus, without greed, there be no war, no poverty, etc. Only utopia. But part of the thing is utopia, the real the original meaning was something that could not be achieved. And so Moore was writing this, and this had great influence. We'll talk about more. And then Erasmus. And both of these are kind of considered to be part of the Reformation or the Renaissance, but I saved them for here. They were friends. He was from the Netherlands. A complex area that wasn't really a country to our point of view yet. And one of the things that he made his living translating things in the vernacular. So translating things into German, Dutch, French, and made a lot of money doing this. This was becoming big business. Remember the printing press. He translated the New and Old Testament into uh, Flemish and also into German. Big money. But he would write in the praise of folly. And this was satire. Satire is writing something as it is true. You write something as realistic. So you try to take a real story. So it looks real, but then you use exaggeration and hyperbole to criticize. And, um, hey, a friend of mine just drove by. Good story, huh? Do you use this uh, to criticize or to mock? Uh, satire, uh, if you ever watch like Saturday Night Live or more, um, those kind of things where they satirize, you know, life or commercials or politics. And good satire is is my favorite type of humor. I'll just tell you honest, I'm not a fan of Saturday Night Live. But in this, he mocked greed. This sounds a lot like Thomas More. They wrote letters about it, especially greed amongst the clergy, while at the same time claiming they were leading to salvation, thus this attack, the hypocrisy of the church. So you already have humanism, Christian humanism, questioning the church, individualism, exploration, new ideology, problems within the church, and this would help trigger the Reformation or the famous saying, he laid the egg that Luther hatched. What an amazing place to stop. Okay, so... That is what we covered today. Big, a lot of stuff today, exploration, reformation. There'll be a couple things tomorrow, and then the day the universe changed. All right. It just timed out that way. I guess I showed the day the universe changed last time with a, a B-Day, too. Hey, uh, it's just the way it goes. It's kind of, it's one of those things where it just seems like a weekly thing. I do it that way. So if there's no questions, I, I think this is really interesting stuff. It's, it's such an amazing time. You will see the similar things like uh, end of the 18th century. We'll see something similar in 
in the 18th century up until about 1840, then the middle of the 18th century, we see this kind of huge change from 1910 to like 1950. And then, you know, there's these incredible hinge times. And this was an amazing time. If there's no questions, I'm stopping recording.